Coming up on this Thursday edition of Newsline at Noon, President Park decides to keep incumbent Prime Minister Jong Hong Won, reversing her earlier decision to accept his resignation after her two nominees for his successor pulled out in the past month. The two Koreas hold high-level talks for the first time in six months to discuss ways to normalise their jointly-run business park at the North Korean border town of Gaesong. Plus, China for the first time takes part in a multinational naval exercise in the Pacific, sending the second-largest fleet for the drill following the US. These stories are more on Newsline at Noon. It's noon Thursday, June 26th here in Korea. Thanks for tuning in live from Seoul. I'm Oh Jin Ju. It's very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. Our top story this lunchtime. After seeing her last two prime minister nominees pull out before they got anywhere near a confirmation hearing, President Park and Hae has decided against naming a third. She has decided to retain current Prime Minister Chong Hong Won. For details, we connect live to our correspondent Chi Yusan. Yusan, fill us in. Jinju Mark, in a surprise announcement by the senior press secretary on this Thursday, the presidential office said President Park had rejected Prime Minister Chung Hong Wan's previous offer to resign and asked him to continue working for the nation with a sense of duty. Prime Minister Chung had expressed the wish to step down in the wake of the Sewol Ho ferry accident two months ago. It's the first time in Korea's constitutional history that a prime minister will be staying on after rendering a resignation. The press secretary said the president, who has promised a massive restructuring of the government and a bolstering of the national safety system following April's ferry tragedy, had gone to great pains before making the latest decision. He added the prolonged administrative vacuum from two failed prime minister appointments and a growing division of public opinion had prompted the president to act quickly. As soon as President Buck's eight cabinet nominees go through confirmation hearings and the government restructuring bill passes parliament, the tripartite system that includes a prime minister and two deputies will push ahead with the president's three-year economic innovation plan along with other initiatives. In regards to the presidential office's personnel verification system, which has been heavily criticized after the recent back-to-back -back nominee withdrawals, a new senior secretary will be put in charge of finding people to fill positions and verifying their credentials. In response, the ruling party said the president's decision was understandable and that she had put a priority on minimizing the administrative vacuum and moving forward with the running of state affairs. The main opposition, on the other hand, criticized the administration for failing to meet the people's expectations to reform Korean society in the aftermath of the ferry disaster. This was Choi Yusan reporting on President Buck's decision to retain Prime Minister Chung Hong Won. And moving on, inter-Korean talks on ways to improve the Kaesong Industrial Complex are currently underway in the North Korean border city of Kaesong. The meeting is the first in six months, and some are taking it as a sign of thawing inter-Korean tensions. Hwang Seung-hee reports. For the first time in six months, officials from the two Koreas met for talks to discuss matters related to their jointly run Kaesong Industrial Complex. The quarterly meeting of the Joint Committee of the Business Park has been at a standstill since December last year, when inter-Korean relations soured following military drills between Seoul and Washington. Departing for Kaesong on Thursday morning, the South Korean delegation said the meeting was an opportunity to review how far they've come with the normalization of the business park. As the meeting comes after a long time, it will serve as an opportunity to inspect the tasks of developing and normalizing the complex. Key issues up for discussion include the installment of Internet connection and the implementation of an electronic entry system to facilitate South Korean workers commute in and out of the complex. The Kaesong complex, which opened in the early 2000s, is one of the last remaining symbols of inter-Korean cooperation. With some 50,000 North Koreans working for more than 120 South Korean factories, 
Operations at the complex are greatly influenced by the state of inter-Korean ties. Last year, the factory zone set idle for five months after North Korea unilaterally closed it down amid escalating tensions on the Korean peninsula. Some say Thursday's talks could be seen as a sign of Pyongyang's willingness to try and thaw the current icy relations between the two Koreas. Hwang sang Arirang News. The world's largest international maritime exercise, Deb Rimpak, begins on this Thursday off the coast of Hawaii, and this year it has an added edge. China, for the first time, will be joining the U.S.-led naval drills. Experts are saying this shows that neither Washington nor Beijing want their military-to-military -military relations to deteriorate. Shin Se-min has more. For the first time ever, Chinese naval ships will be firing gunshots off the coast of Hawaii inside U.S. maritime territory as part of multi-nation naval drills. The biannual naval exercise, dubbed RIMPAC, begins Thursday with a total of 23 countries taking part. Four Chinese ships, including a missile destroyer and more than 1,000 Chinese military personnel, are already in Hawaii. The exercises come amid tensions as Beijing continues to assert itself in its maritime disputes in the East and South China Seas, while Washington seeks to reinforce its influence in the Asia-Pacific region. U.S.-China relations have also been strained by U.S. claims of cyber espionage by Beijing. China rejects Washington's accusations. The U.S. government says it invited China as a means to ease tensions and boost naval cooperation between the two countries. In a recent report to Congress, the Pentagon said it would continue to monitor China's evolving military strategy, doctrine and force development while building the foundations of a stronger military-to-military -military relationship with Beijing. China's attitude towards the U.S. has softened with the invite. In the run-up to the drills, China's deputy naval commander stressed the importance of the world's two superpowers establishing stronger military ties. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. A U.S. lawmaker has denounced Japan for denying its historical wrongdoings. Chairman of the U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee Ed Royce made the comments before meeting with visiting Korean Vice Foreign Minister Jo Taeyong on Wednesday. Royce said it was important that Japan and others learn from history so as not to repeat the mistakes of the past. He said that one of the most important lessons was to admit referencing Tokyo's recent review of the Kono Statement, which acknowledged the Japanese military had forced women into sexual servitude during World War II. Although the Japanese government upheld the statement, it claimed there was no evidence to support the claims of the former sex slaves. Joe said he appreciated Royce's support and that it sent a strong signal to those who were trying to whitewash history. Japan and North Korea will hold another round of talks next week to work on the details of an agreement reached late last month. Japanese Foreign Minister Fumio Keshida said Wednesday that the two sides will sit down on July 1st in Beijing, where North Korean officials will explain how a special committee plans to reinvestigate the abductions of Japanese nationals in the 1970s and 80s. Tokyo hopes the probe extends to all North Korean institutions. Under the terms of the agreement, Japan will ease certain sanctions on the North once the investigation begins. And on the economic front, Korea's corporate profitability improved in the first quarter of this year on the back of the nation's moderate economic recovery. But the outlook for the second quarter remains bleak. Our Hwang Jie explains why. In the first three months of this year, Korean companies seem to be weathering economic uncertainties at home and abroad rather well, reflecting the nation's moderate recovery track during the period. Korea's central bank says that corporate profitability improved in the first quarter of this year from a year earlier. The average ratio of operating profit to sales, which is a key measure of profitability, reached 5.2 percent in the January to March period, up from 4.8 percent a year ago. That means companies are now getting 52 cents in profit out of every $100 in sales, whereas they earned 48 cents in the previous year. 
The central bank says, however, that the upbeat trend might not continue on through the second quarter. That is, because of the ferry disaster in April that resulted in the further denting of already sluggish private spending. The state-run think tank Korea Development Institute has cut its growth outlook for this year by 0.2 percentage points to 3.7 percent, citing the negative impact on domestic demand due to the tragedy. For a glimpse on the pace of recovery in the second quarter of this year, pundits are waiting for May figures, which will give a better indication of whether the impact of the disaster is temporary or more long-term. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Now, revitalizing the economy tops President Peck's to-do list, and this is what she wants from her finance minister-designate Che kyung Hwan. Che has suggested a policy of boosting domestic demand by making it easier for households to borrow money, but economists warn the nation's household debt is already dangerously high. Connie Kim has the details. The nation's household debt has grown so much that it is threatening to hurt future growth of the economy. And that's the warning by a major government think tank. The state-run Korea Development Institute said Korea's household debt topped one trillion U.S. dollars at the end of last year, accounting for 85.6 percent of the country's GDP. The think tank says consumers would start cutting back in consumption once the combined debt of households grows some 85 percent of an economy's gross domestic product, thereby hurting growth. The think tank's report spells problems for a new policy suggested by Finance Minister-designate Che Kyung-hwan, who seeks to encourage households to borrow more, to buy homes and other real estates as a means of spurring economic activities at home. If regulators lower bars for lending, it will revitalize the housing and construction sector in the short term. However, in the long term, the overall economy is expected to become vulnerable. In that sense, second thoughts must be given before they start easing limits for housing loans for the sake of short-term benefits. Credit rating agency Fitch has also echoed the warning, saying easing regulations on home purchases could aggravate the already serious household debt problem. Economists express concern that the debts of Korean households are growing faster than the pace of income growth. With mounting household debt reaching dangerously high levels in Korea, the incoming finance minister has a tough job on his hands. He'll be tasked with bringing mounting debt levels under control while also boosting domestic consumption. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Now, it's not only ballooning household debt that is adding to the burden of mid-income families. Wages grew at the slowest pace in more than two years in the first quarter of the year. Data from the Bank of Korea shows real wages came to an average of around 2,900 U.S. dollars per person in the first three months. Now, although that is up 1.8 percent from the same period last year, it's the smallest jump since the fourth quarter of 2011. This means it could take time for domestic demand to fall. Recover. The real wage growth represents the income growth of an employee working in a firm with five or more workers after taking into account the effects of inflation. And continuing on with our coverage of the 2014 Brazil World Cup. Well, we have four more teams now have advanced to the last 16. That's right. And to find out which teams have qualified for the knockout stages, we turn things to our SJ Lee standing by. Good afternoon, SJ. Good afternoon, guys, as well. Now, of course, with four matches taking place earlier today, it, gained, it came down to the final group stage matches in Group E and F. And to see who qualified, let's take a look at the highlights from earlier today, starting off with Nigeria taking on Argentina. Now, it didn't take long for the first goal to be scored as the great Leo Messi scores in just the third minute of the match. But less than a minute later, Ahmed Faraz Musa answers back with an equalizer and it's 1-1. One one. Now, both players would score once again later in the match, but it's Rojo in the 50th minute who gives Argentina the 3-2 lead and the win. But Nigeria still advances to the next round. Next up, Bosnia-Herzegovina taking on Iran. Now, people thought this was going to be a boring match, but this match full of goals, including Eden Zeko, who scored in the 23rd minute as Bosnia-Herzegovina easily took this match 3-1, your final score. 
Meanwhile, over in Group B, Ecuador taking needing a win against France in order to advance to the next round. But this match ends in a nil-nil draw, giving Switzerland a golden opportunity. And with that, Switzerland going up against Honduras, it's Zerden Shakiri scoring not once, not twice, but three times and for a hat trick, giving Switzerland the 3 0 win as they advance to the round of 16 after finishing second in Group E. And of course, tomorrow Korea will be facing off against Belgium in their final group stage match, hoping to win big in order to advance to the next round. So, how does the Belgian team look? Well, let's take a look at their strengths and weaknesses. Now, of course, taking a look here, Belgium is a very well-rounded team. They score well from the right side with Eden Hazard leading the way, and they score well with set pieces, something once again Korea has to a hard time defending against. And their greatest is their defense, and they didn't give up a single match where they gave up more than a goal during the World Cup qualifying matches, so definitely a strong team here. But taking a look at their weakness, though, they're terrible at defending at the wings. In fact, in out of the 32 nations, they give up the most goals to wingers, and at the same time, they tend to lose focus on the defense late in the match. Now, most of the goals they do give up tend to be at the final 15 minutes, and they also have a hard time scoring late as well. And now finishing things off, Luis Suarez has got himself in trouble once again after biting Georgia Kilaney during Uruguay's 1-0 win yesterday. And now he might be facing another suspension, this time much longer. Now FIFA has requested that all the evidence of the incident be sent in as soon as possible. And according to several reports, Suarez can get up to two years in suspension if found guilty. Of course, this isn't the first time that he's bitten an opponent. In fact, it's his third time. His last incident coming in over a year ago when he bit Blanislav Ivanovic in the arm and was suspended 10 matches. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Time now for a look through the international headlines we're following on this Thursday lunchtime. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim standing by at the News Centre. Eunice, let's begin in Iraq. The troubled Prime Minister there has rejected the idea of forming a national salvation government. That's right. There have been calls for Prime Minister Nuri al-Maliki to step down. He's been blamed for stoking the insurgency we see today uh, with his poor governance said marginalized minority sex. But he flatly ruled out that possibility of forming a national emergency government, warning that such calls represented, quote, a coup against the Constitution and an attempt to end the democratic process. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, who is in Brussels for NATO talks, urged Mideast nations to hold their fire. This as U.S. and Iraqi senior military officials confirmed Syrian warplanes had launched airstrikes in Iraq, likely against ISIL militants who had joined forces with the al-Nusra Front, al-Qaeda's affiliate in Syria at the two countries' border. The move is significant as it does open the way for militants to further grip, uh, firm their grip on both sides of that border. An explosion at a busy shopping plaza in Nigeria's capital city of Abuja has killed at least 21 people and injured at least 17 others. Police were securing what they described as a crime scene, though it was yet unclear who or what was behind that blast. Eyewitnesses described scenes of chaos at the city's Wu's district. Body parts scattered, people covered in blood, and smoke billowing in the area. Cars outside the complex were burned out and windows shattered. The BBC reports the shopping district was packed with people at the time. 
Western nations are warning they have more sanctions in store for Russia unless Moscow ask, acts further to de escalate tensions in Ukraine. Following a meeting of NATO foreign ministers, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry urged Russian President Vladimir Putin to publicly call on separatists in Ukraine to lay down their arms. While applauding President Putin's request to cancel a law that would have cleared him to launch a military intervention in Ukraine, Kerry said that could be, quote, reversed in 10 minutes. Officials also said German Chancellor Angela Merkel and French President François Hollande spoke to Putin and Ukraine's President Petro Poroshenko on the phone for an hour Wednesday to urge them to work together. And finally, the U.S. economy shrank at a much steeper pace than expected in the first quarter, its gross domestic product recording a seasonally adjusted rate of minus 2.9 percent. The U.S. Commerce Department had reported an anticipated 1 percent drop last month, but instead observed the sharpest contraction in five years. Experts believe the economy was held back by an unusually bitter and long winter. Consumer spending was also held down by expiring long-term unemployment benefits and cuts to food stamps. But the concern appears to be short-lived as recovery appears to be accelerating with consumer spending, hiring and business investment on the rise. Stay up to date on the latest news out of Korea. Connecting to our team of reporters about the issues that matter to Korea. On air, on your mobile, online. Find out more about Korea on Newsline at Noon with Mark Broom and Ah Jin Ju. Even when I'm Ah Jin Ju, market researcher, strategy analytics said Thursday that LG Electronics brought in about 11. You may have wondered which country does the most good for the planet before. Well, according to a new report, it isn't South Korea. And the Good Country Index, created by independent policy advisor Simon Anholt, measured 125 countries based on their contributions to humanity. And this was using data from the United Nations, the World Bank and other global institutions. South Korea came in at number 47 out of 125 on the list. It was boosted by its contributions to science, technology and culture, but uh, it was pulled down by poor marks in international peace and security. Ireland ranked number one on the index, followed by Finland and Switzerland, while Libya, Vietnam and Iraq brought up the rear. North Korea was not included on the list. Actors and sportsmen to government officials and researchers, dozens of people from around the world have been invited to Korea by the country's culture ministry to build, hopefully, a global network by taking part in the Cultural Partnership Initiative. Our cultural correspondent Park ji -won has this report. 80 people from 40 different countries will explore Korea for the next five months as part of the Cultural Partnership Initiative program run by the nation's cultural ministry. Participants will spend that time at 16 different host organizations, including the National Theater of Korea and the National Kugak Center. Participants will take part in diverse activities from performance to research. As a taekwondo player, instructor and a coach in my country, this is a very good opportunity because the Korea is the main part of the taekwondo, heart of the taekwondo, especially Kukiwon, and I'm really happy to be here as a CPI uh, member. I'm a theatrical performer. I make sound with my body, sound effect, uh, for example, and I play talking drum as well, a traditional drum. I believe I'm good to... Uh, explore so much in, uh, <laughs> in South Korea. I came to Korea for uh, research Korean music and culture uh, and next five months I will be in Jeonju at the uh, Intangible Cultural Heritage Center for Pacific and Asia region. Since 2005, nearly 900 people have participated in the annual cultural exchange program. It aims to enrich cultural diversity and build networks among global experts through the sharing of their own cultures. Park ji -won, Arirang News.
Good afternoon. Well, clouds will be sticking around throughout the day and temperatures will be as hot as yesterday. So most parts of the peninsula can expect another hot and humid day today. And the monsoon of Friday is traveling northward and Jeju is being affected. So the people of Jeju should see 5 to 20 millimeters of monsoon rain during the day and sporadic showers are in store in the mountainous regions of Gangwon-do province and some parts of Gyeongsangbuk-do province later in the day. And here is the weather outlook for here in Seoul. Lots of clouds will continue to dominate. And on Saturday, it looks like we have outbreaks of rain may be seen during the day. So take the weather into account when you plan for the weekend. With that, let's take a closer look at the readings for today. The high in the capital and Gwangju will rise to 29, while Busan should make it to 25 later in the afternoon. Now for other regions, down on Jeju should see a high of 23, while Mount Kungang hikes up to 20. Well, that's all for me today, and back to you guys in the studio. Well, thank you very much, Gion, for the weather there, and those are the stories we're following at this hour. Mark and I will be back at the same time tomorrow. Thank you for watching.